I'm Danny Dorling, I'm Professor of Human Geography at the University of Sheffield and I'm interested in mapping what happens to people depending on where they live in the world, nationally and within the city I live in. In theory, the internet has quite a lot of uh, chances of, of reducing social and economic inequalities because it's cheap, it gives you a way of accessing resources where it doesn't matter where you can get to and so on. In practice, the reality tends to be very, very different because you actually have to be able to get a computer, you have to be able to afford a fixed telephone line, you don't have to be able to afford uh, to get on uh, to the web and so on. And that just creates a growing divide between different groups of people, old and young, but particularly different groups of young people, some of whom have no computers in their home, others of whom have a computer in every bedroom. There's a moral imperative to get more people on to the web in the same way that there was a moral imperative to build and um, stock libraries 100 years ago. Uh, it is simply unfair that some people have access to information and other people don't. But unlike that great movement of stocking libraries, we, we don't really have an equivalent movement yet today that says that this access should be ubiquitous and shouldn't depend on your ability to pay for something that is very, very expensive from the point of view of a low-income household. As the internet becomes more ubiquitous, there is a danger that we could actually increase social divides by assuming that people have it, know how to use it and can access it so that those that don't find that they're having to travel to offices to do things in a way that most people don't have to do, and then that service becomes worse because it's assumed to be a service just for the poor. At a superficial level, people claim that technologies like the internet reduce geographical boundaries, you can live anywhere, work anywhere, and so on. In practice, what we find when we look at people in a country like Britain is that they're becoming more socially polarised over time between areas, so the rich are huddling together in, in areas where they feel comfortable, the very poor are becoming more segregated from the rest of society, and that's happening at the same time as these internet technologies have spread. So there's no evidence that they've made space matter less. And if anything, being in a place where it is normal to be on the, online and so on requires a certain amount of money, that means that some households can't afford to live there as much as it was possible in the past. And so you're, you're seeing people beginning to divide street by street, community by community, by how much money and wealth they've got, and similarly by how internet savvy they are and how much equipment they have or just simply don't have. In answer to the question, is the web really for everyone? I think it's very similar to, to asking, is literacy really for everyone? And we often forget what incredible times we live in. Um, Currently, a very large number of the world's adults are literate, and a large number of adults in a country like Britain are illiterate. In, in the old-fashioned, can you read um, a complicated sentence in a book form of illiteracy. But worldwide, now, five out of six children are literate. They can, they can read books, they can write, and so on. It's never been the case before. This is the first time in human history that you have basic paper literacy. The same will happen within just one or two generations with the web. Um, you, need, you need access to the web like you need to be able to read if you want to join in what it is to be human nowadays. And we can see where those divides where people are treated worse or treated well are starkest by different rates of old-fashioned literacy, illiteracy, and nowadays by literacy on the web. And do you have access? Can you use it? Or are you denied? There are great risks with society becoming more internet-dependent. Um, these risks, you could compare it to the television age. You might think that television would be a wonderful thing, but we can chart from the 1950s onwards an almost parallel increase in rates of things like burglary uh, with the increase in rates of adverts appearing on commercial television in Britain. Um, television doesn't necessarily have to be a force for good, it doesn't have to be a force for bad, but if it becomes something that uh, shoves into your home and into your children's mind the idea that you need more toys, you need to buy more things and so on, it becomes quite a destructive social force. And if you think about the internet and how it's funded, I mean, who actually pays for all these web pages to exist, and why all those adverts are around the edge and, and how they're recording what you're interested in so they can put the right ad up for you, there's no reason not to believe that the same nasty detrimental effect on society that advertising has had will not occur with the internet. We can stop it, you can prevent it. Um, it is possible to ban large amounts of advertising and see it as harmful, particularly advertising that's aimed at getting in the minds of children and making them feel inadequate. But so far, as far as I'm aware, there's been very little work on the internet to say we do not want adverts aimed at children in the same way as we've begun to get rid of adverts aimed to make children feel insecure on television.
One great advantage of the internet is it gets rid of the need to have such a hierarchical society. Before the internet, you could, for instance, only have a few great university libraries, which meant you could only have a few great universities, which meant that if you went to one of those universities, you could be great, but if you didn't, you couldn't. Um, the internet blows that out. Now, we still have to work out ourselves how to then deal with that and not make such a big thing about certain universities as opposed to other universities, as opposed to other ways of learning. Um, but without the internet, you could not get rid of that kind of hierarchy because it was spatially fixed. Uh, you couldn't have everything everywhere and so only a few people could have access to it and you would have a world in which a few would rule everybody else. That is now theoretically changeable, whether we actually change it is, is up to us. Um, I think the biggest challenge of the 21st century is human greed and how we can learn to live more equally together and if you can begin to solve that, many other things simply fall into place.